Good morning, everyone. Welcome to session one, Sustainable Energy. Where are we today? Defining the path forward. My name is Andrew Reed, the moderator for this session. Just a quick introduction. I'm the manager with Con Edison's Distribution Engineering Department. My team is a diverse group of engineers and analysts focused on developing solutions that mitigate public safety risks, improve electric system performance, while advancing public safety policy. Prior to this role, I worked with our innovation team within Con Edison's Utility of the Future Department, in Con Edison's Research and Development Department, and General Electric's Research Center for focusing, focusing on developing innovative solutions in the energy industry. I'm truly excited to participate um, in this session today, and I believe you'll get a lot out of it. But before I go into the session description, just some housekeeping items. We'll do some brief introductions of the panelists. The full bios are available in the browser below the session description. We'll have a moderated session for approximately one hour, followed by 30 minutes of Q&A from the audience. During this time, you can post your questions in the chat. With that said to the session, the energy landscape is undergoing tremendous change. In this regard, New York and other states have passed ambitious legislation measures, legislative measures involving energy sustainability that are aimed at leading the nation in carbon reduction. This panel of experts bring their unique insights to the table, putting in perspective the roadmap of what comes next. I'm joined by five panelists and I will let them introduce themselves. Starting with Carolyn Green, Thank you, Andrew, and it's nice to be here. I'm Carolyn Green. I am the um, managing partner of Energreen Capital Management, which um, actually has two companies under it. One is Professional Environmental Engineers, which is located in uh, St. Louis, and the other is Casa Verde Energy Services, which is an energy efficiency company headquartered in Houston. I uh, formed Energreen after a career in the energy industry, uh, most recently as the Vice President for Health, Environment, and Safety for Sunoco. And um, I also um, came off of a, a uh, stint as the uh, National Board Chair of ABE. Thank you, Carolyn. Welcome. Thanks. Next, we'll introduce to the stage, Mark Chambers. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me here. I appreciate the ability to join all of you. My name is Mark Chambers, and I am the Director of Sustainability for New York City, for the great American sanctuary city that is New York. I am happy to join all of you. Uh, before taking on this role several years ago, I also directed sustainability and energy for Washington. Washington, D.C. municipal government. I'm an architect by trade, uh, and I'm here to not just join all of you in kind of crafting a place forward for um, our role in this energy transformation, but also as a species, making sure that we are going to hang out a little bit longer. And part of that has to do with being really thoughtful and intentional about how we incorporate uh, as many transformational decision-making um, choices in both our kind of day-to-day -day everyday lives, but also in our decisions about the systems that underpin a lot of the, the cities and towns and, and, uh, and states that we're all a part of. So happy to join this conversation today and happy to make sure that we are all kind of thinking on a lens that is not just the next few months, but is also the next one year, five years, 10 years, 50 years uh, in terms of our relationship to our home planet. Oh, thank you, Mark. Welcome. Uh, next to the stage is Steve Wimple. Good morning, and thanks for um, inviting me to participate in this. Uh, I'm the general manager of Con Edison's Utility of the Future organization. Uh, we were set up to look at some of New York's reform in the energy vision initiatives, promoting distributed energy resources and helping customers improve their energy usage and use it smartly and more efficiently, including the ability to produce a lot of renewable energy on site. Uh, I also had a fun stint at Con Edison's clean energy businesses, which is actually the second largest solar 
developer and operator in North America. So have some good hands-on of what it takes to develop renewable energy and looking forward to a lively discussion today on how do we green up our uh, our city, our state, and our region, because that's what the future requires. Thank you, Steve. Next, uh, Dr. Amy Marshall. Hello, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Andrew, for the introduction. I am a energy storage uh, division group leader and scientist at Brookhaven National Lab. I also hold a joint appointment as a faculty member at Stony Brook University. Um, my background is in chemistry and material science, and we study electrochemical energy storage systems or batteries. So we're very interested in Stony Brook at Brookhaven at looking at next generation battery systems and thinking about how um, batteries can be a part of the clean energy landscape and transforming the future grid. Thank you, Amy. Welcome. Thank you. And last but not least, Donald Shabazzpour. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I am a director in our regulatory strategy group. I have been in the company for about 17 years. And I've spent the majority of that time, the last 10 years, really focusing on climate change to get to some of those big question issues that Mark just brought up. But in my current role, I'm really thinking about is the transition that the natural gas business and the gas networks have to make to get to net zero, which is where we want to go in terms of policy to address climate change. So it's a pleasure to be here. Great, thank you, and thank you, everyone. So let's just dive right in, um, starting with giving the attendees a little bit of a perspective. Um, you know, the, the session description talks about a, a tremendous change taking place. So, from your perspective, and, and we want to give everybody an opportunity to provide their own um, and through the lens that they, they they look to. What is this tremendous change taking place within the industry industry right now, and why is it happening? Maybe we start with um, uh, Carolyn. Well, <clears throat> I think a couple couple of uh, background issues. One clearly is the um, the pandemic and what has happened to energy demand, um, particularly over the the last uh, ten or eleven months. That I think has accelerated a change that has been going on in in the industry away from uh, a lot of the legacy um, power plants particularly coal, but increasingly even natural gas. Um, we're at a point where renewables are um, in the front of everyone's mind. And, and so the question is not whether a, a clean energy future, it's when a clean energy future. And I think people are looking at um, the four Ds I call them of uh, clean energy. One is decarbonization, getting the carbon out of the um, the power chain. Secondly, is decentralization. We've always had a a kind of a spoke and hub uh, system for energy delivery, and that's kind of being shot in the head. Um, the third is I I think it's a horrible name, but democratization, which means that. Everyone has a um, an equal stake and uh, and should at least have a seat at the table. And the last is di digitization. Um, as we're digitizing the energy system, it it allows us to um, to look at options that we never had before. With that, though, the issue of equity and um, and efficiency for me, really come to the fore, particularly as we're talking about digitization. If the pandemic has shown anything, it uh, it is that there is an increasing, increasing gap between uh, haves and have not communities in terms of their access to um, digitization. And that has, for me, uh, profound uh, impacts on, on the um, access of communities of color in particular to ener clean energy resources. And, and that's uh, certainly my uh, biggest concern. Thank you. And I'm curious from, from Mark's perspective as well, from a city um, and, and how you see the change. There's a lot of policy, 
goals being set um, <clears throat> in many states in New York State. Um, what what change do you see um, from your perspective? I timed out for a second there. Is, I, I think you're directing the question to me. <laughs> the um, so I, I kind of just want to pick up a little bit on what Carolyn was saying um, and make sure that you know, we're we're hitting the kind of the nail on the head with this. One of the big things that uh, we have to recognize is that the context for all of these conversations is changing. Right? And so I know that Carolyn doesn't love the the democratization term, but like the but the idea behind it, I think that the power structure that that um, underpins a lot of uh, the decision making around some of these uh, energy choices, uh, it, it can't stay the same while everything else around us is changing. Right. And so if we are seeing significant change in in the power structure that underpins societal changes and things that relate more uh, succinctly to social justice, then how we look at um, the other systems that underpin our society also have to change with that. So I think we've been we've been building up to this moment where we look at the the ability for decentralized energy production to start to give more power to communities in terms of centralized um, control. Those are the same pieces that I think are going to be unfolding and that us as legislators and as policymakers have an opportunity to support and to lay the framework for. One of the things that I have to constantly be um, hitting the drum uh, about is the fact that we are out of time to make some of these really significant changes. So uh, part of our challenge is whether it's from the, the city side with things like our carbon or um, our climate mobilization acts or the state side with the CLCPA, like we have the ability to create this, these bookends that say that, hey, no matter what we're doing in the next 10 years, we have to significantly advance our, 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 uh, the playing field for all All of these different components to be able to advance and so that means that uh, we we get an opportunity to, to lay the foundation and say it can't just be one of these things you have to simultaneously be giving to communities be giving more ability for them to make different choices so that other parts of their lives will kind of sink in line with the view their energy futures great any any from a utility perspective or from a technology perspective any anything to add to that as well? <laughs> Andrew, if I could just tie in and follow up on what Caroline and Mark were saying, you know, I, I, I think we all agree we need to make sure that uh, customers throughout the city, state, and region have the right tools to uh, understand how they're using energy, to use it on a cleaner basis where possible, to uh, produce it locally on a clean basis, whether that's rooftop solar or um, battery storage, or in some cases, as you go a little further away from New York City, it could be uh, other forces, sources of renewable energy at the customer premise. So, you know, we, we have to start locally at the customer level. We have to make sure that the grid itself can handle this new two way flow of power. But when we think about, you know, uh, the downstate area, especially New York City, there are challenges with the density of the population and the density of the load. We're never going to have uh, enough local renewables being produced. So we have to adapt the grid to be able to accommodate offshore wind, to accommodate more imports of, of renewables from upstate. And that's just on the electric side. The whole decarbonization has to go much further. It has to impact transportation. It has to impact home heating. It has to impact a lot of the other uh, sort of economy-wide uses of energy. And that itself is going to create a feedback loop that is, as we shift more energy usage onto either renewable natural gas that I think Don will touch on or uh, renewable electricity, we have to make sure that we have the production and the delivery infrastructure to keep up with that feedback loop of trying to shift some of our more carbon intensive uh, energy uses onto cleaner fuel fuels. Don, would you like to add? Yeah, maybe I'll just add a little. Um, it's just building on what everything that's been said. If you had, I think, looking over the last 100 years, a utility, doesn't matter which utility, and, and they, they talked about energy, they would say it has to be two things, reliable and affordable. 
But you ask your question, what has changed? There's now a third dimension that's been added to that. It's no longer good enough just to be reliable and affordable. It has to be sustainable. So what does sustainable mean, right? I think Carolyn touched some of this, and so did Mark. But it's really then comes back to the climate change, right? It's the science is saying you have to get to net zero. And that actually has changed from a few years ago. Um, a few years ago, the, the target was 80-50, 80% emission reduction by 2050. But the science is saying that that's not even you know good enough. You have to get to net zero by 2050. So we have these issues that other panelists talked about. But what makes it also uh, a really important time is that this problem has a clock attached to this, right? We can't just wait to decarbonize the economy over time because the longer you wait, and this is what this, you know, sort of the consensus of the scientific community is, the greater the consequences, and it will be the more difficult to decarbonize the entire economy to get to those elements that Carolyn was talking about by 2050. So I think that dynamic is part of this conversation as well. Yeah, and I think from the from the technology side, you know, technology can really be a driver here if we have a, a, a safe, uh, reliable way to store the energy and then to release it on demand, that can play a big part in allowing us to integrate renewables effectively into the energy landscape. It can also play a large part in uh, decentralization, uh, decarbonization, you know, achieving a lot of these goals. But we need to continue to advance that technology. So, you know, the, the lithium ion battery, you know, the subject of the 2019 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, you know, revolutionized how we use uh, portable consumable electronics. You know, it allows us to, to take our iPhone with us, to take our laptop, to, you know, have a no, whole new way of using energy, but to have effective energy on a grid scale and safe deployment in crowded, you know, dense urban areas like New York City, um, we'll need new technologies. We, we need technologies that are sustainable, that are clean, that are green, uh, that are safe and that are reliable. And so I think it's a real exciting time for um, scientists and um, <clears throat> technology users and policymakers to really work together to, to shape this new energy landscape. I heard a couple of things um, in there where, you know, COVID has accelerated um, this. I think one of the lessons from COVID is, you know, the more you delay, the more costly it gets. Um, and, and potentially as you delay, you potentially exacerbate, exacerbate you know, existing inequalities that exist. Um, and so how, what actions do we need to take now, both in the, in the near term and, and, and what do we need to, to do uh, going forward in the long term? Um, to fill some of the, the the gaps that have been identified between you know, the long term gaps that, that exist, um, love to hear kind of what specific actions we can take to kind of implement um, or, or get to the goals that we're, we we aspire to get to. At least from my standpoint, uh, two things: no matter what technology we use, we've got to have some um, changes in the way we use energy efficiency. Um, is the first uh, step in in any process because it doesn't matter uh, whether the uh, the energy source is clean if the envelope is uh, has holes in it. So we need to make sure that we are um, using our energy as whatever source it comes from as efficiently as possible, and um, and we also need to recognize that the overwhelming buck, bulk of the infrastructure that will be here in 2050 is already here. So we need to make sure that we're um, retrofitting our, uh, our infrastructure to be more, uh, more efficient. And that's uh, particularly an issue um, in the discussion about equity, because we need to make sure that people who don't have the ability to um, retrofit periodically, that happens for them so that that our our infrastructure stays on pace uh, with where we need it to be. And I'll, I'll add to that, you know, 
we saw very plain and laid bare, not just in our city, but in cities all across the country and world, the disparities in the impact of COVID-19, right? So black and brown people experience morbidity at an incremental, like significantly incremental uh, rate uh, than others, which means that there are, (laughs) yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, And so like, so significantly, which means that uh, these things are like, we have to recognize the interconnection between um, how we are living our, in our society right now and what our options are to be able to, to change that. And so, I mean, a perfect example is during the summer, recognizing that um, vulnerable populations in, in New York City, particularly elderly, uh, they were not going to be able to go to cooling centers, not going to be able to go to rec centers, places where they could um, escape the summer heat from their apartments because of uh, social distancing. And we had to embark on a program to rapidly deploy 75,000 air conditioned units. Um, not ideal in terms of reducing demand, right? Uh, of course, we'd want to be able to to, uh, to make different choices, but people are suffering right now, right? And so I think that when we recognize the, the connection between uh, what I said before about social justice and, and climate justice, what it means is that um, if we fail to kind of recognize that connection and address both simultaneously, we will fail to accomplish either, right? And to 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 address either, because we have to ask ourselves, while we're trying to protect our future, like who are we protecting that future for? And are we protecting to make sure that everyone gets to participate in that future? And that means making choices right now to address some of those systemic and kind of um, inequalities to make sure that we are building a bigger team so that everyone can actually be able to uh, to take part in a lot of the transformative uh, things that we are we're advocating for. So I think that it's important to kind of, when we look at the impacts of, of COVID, it's lessons learned, it's um, the exclamation points that put on some things that we already, already knew, and then it's how it informs our decision making to make sure that we are able to do more than one thing at a time with a lot of the policies that we're implementing. So I think that we're going to see that more and more, that you're going to have to consistently be making sure that you're coupling some of these additional, whether it's technology interventions or other policy interventions with um, measures that will address uh, inequality. Um, we simultaneously with the deployment of that, we also petitioned the Public Service Commission for um, for bill relief for the, the full um, uh, several months of the summer to make sure that half a million New Yorkers would have bill relief during that time. So you have to build out the, the effort to make sure you're addressing the present concerns as well as protecting for the future. How, how is um, like the utility, from a utility perspective um, approaching that as well? Um, is there you know, measures or, or programs looking to address um, some of these uh, potential in, um, disparities or, or you know, impacts of, of COVID, do you see, you know, people not having the ability to, um, you know, particularly either pay their bills or um, participating in some of these programs to help achieve these, um, you know, ambitious goals being set by, by, by our, by, by our legislators, you know, like what is, what is from a utility, how does the utility kind of view this, view this challenge as well? And what, what actions are being taken? Sure. So, so, uh, Andrew, uh, good, good point. Good, good question. Uh, in New York, under our, um, sort of governing legislation, the, uh, uh, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, uh, there's a directive that says the utility should make sure that 40% of the benefits of these efforts go to, uh, you know, uh, low and moderate income and otherwise, uh, disadvantaged, uh, communities. So, uh, th- there clearly is, uh, a need to, uh, as Caroline was saying, to ramp up our energy efficiency offerings and make sure that we are helping customers reduce their, the energy, uh, you know, in terms of how much of their, um, uh, disposable income, which is now greatly stressed due to a lot of job loss, you know, trying to help them better manage their energy costs. So you'll see more and more, uh, what I'd call, you know, targeted and, you know, outreach efforts. And I think, the challenge for the utilities is once we engage, we have to make sure we're not just um, doing the easy things, but once we engage with uh, people in our disadvantaged communities is making sure we're doing as much as we possibly can at that touch point. Because uh, once you build up their trust 
open the door to work with them, whether it's, you know, improving the building envelope, looking at alternatives to heating, or doing other things within the community, trying to electrify some of the transportation that is actually a big driver of some health issues. And so a lot of the research is now suggesting that um, the local pollution from um, whether it's local transportation or inefficient heating systems is actually a compounding effect with people who are infected with the coronavirus. So um, making sure that we're embarking on and, you know, uh, particularly with transportation to try to have a meaningful impact in the air quality and in the health and in the well-being of all of our service territory, all of our customers. When it comes to energy efficiency, the, you know, but by improving energy efficiency, you could potentially reduce the, the, the you know, potential shortages from potential, from energy sources. Um, so for gas, maybe one, and, and this one is to you, Don, is as we become more and more efficient, um, as well as, you know, we want to get to net zero. How does, what does a gas utility perspective look like um, in terms of helping to achieve these these goals and objectives? Um, is, is is gas seen as a as a, a role to play, um, or could it? Is there some other challenges maybe experienced by the gas system? So this issue is now front and center, and I would say it's it's very heated. Um, you have a lot of stakeholders in this, uh, and it's being, like I said, vigorously discussed and debated. So I'll give you my sort of perspective. Um, getting to net zero, um, from a technical engineering perspective, I, I always say, like, it makes landing on the moon look like a walk in the park. Because not only it's, it's incredibly difficult from a technical perspective, but it also touches everyone. And it touches everything that we do. Um, and I think some of the other panelists touched on this. So when you start looking at how do we actually get there and you start rolling your sleeves and you start doing the, you know, the math and the analysis and the modeling, and it becomes this sort of, um, in a nutshell, to summarize, but the body of work it's all pointing to, us, which is basically also US, Europe, UK, is that there is no silver bullet, right? There is no silver bullet you need a portfolio of everything that you can throw at it and you'll still be short. And one of the issues then becomes this whole issue of gas, right? For the last few decades, there's a lot of investments that have been made into the gas as sort of the cleanest hydrocarbon. But if you get to net zero, so you can't have a fossil fuel. So first, let me to answer your question, the gas has a role, but I wanna make a distinction between the gas network and the molecules that are flowing through it. So, and the public actually completely gets this when it comes to the electricity, right? They, they understand that electricity network is being decarbonized. It used to come from coal, nuclear, gas, but more and more those electrons are being generated from renewable sources. That distinction has not been made yet by the majority of the stakeholders in the public. Then you can also decarbonize those molecules so what, what is flowing through the system today will also change. And this is actually has happened. You know, traditionally, natural gas, and we still have them in Brooklyn, you know, we have these MGP sites, manufactured gas plants that we're still cleaning up today from 100 years ago, where gas, the methane, was derived from coal. And then with the advent of natural gas, most of our gas started to come from the Gulf of Mexico. Over time, what the molecules will transition to this greener and it will be a combination of what we call renewable natural gas using sustainable biomass feedstocks. New York was actually a leader in this. New York City started injecting renewable natural gas from Staten Island landfill at that time, the world's biggest landfill in 1980s. We now have a wastewater treatment plant coming online in hopefully early 2021 at Newtown Creek in Brooklyn that will utilize two feedstocks, wastewater and also food waste. Um, food waste goes into those digesters. And I think the technology that has the biggest uh, potential to disrupt the industry is hydrogen. Hydrogen, and we can talk about it as well, will also be a molecule, I think, that will, a molecule, uh, let's say that by the 2050s, that will be used across multiple sectors. It won't only be gas, it will be gas, 
for sort of heating and thermal applications, but it will also be in liquid, you know, in liquid forms. And you could see actually, you know, the ships that cross the oceans that run on hydrogen or some power generation that run on gas today. So the short answer to your question is, Andrew, is yes, but there is this, this distinction between the gas network and the gas that's flowing in it today. So that will change. And I think on the generation side, as you integrate more and more renewables, gas will also play a role to map to make, to essentially be be a backup for those resources. So if you think of you know 10, 20 years from now, if you have a system, you know let's say Con Ed, you know the Con Ed system is mostly running on solar and wind to feed New York City. There will be days, whether it's the coldest day of the year or the hottest day, where you don't have enough wind or solar. Typically on the coldest days of the year, you don't have sun, right, and it's not windy. You probably need gas generation to be able to generate that electricity. And as again, you get to net zero, then you say, how do I do that? And I'll come circle back to what Amy was talking about, the important role that technology will place. An enormous amount of innovation is required. And you start to see even that you will need technology such as you know, carbon capture, whether it's direct, you know, uh, direct from air capture or capturing it from a generation plant. So, the portfolio of these technologies will be part of the solution, which comes back to this, that this, you know, how we get there is not really clean. Um, it's messy. But the bottom line, we're going to need all of these technologies to get to where we want to go, which is a very ambitious place. Just just one uh, correction, ahead, Don, uh, and that is on the coldest day, days of the year, it is sunny. I, I, I'm from the upper Midwest. And uh, we used to pray for snow because then there would be a cloud cover and it would be warmer because the cloud would be trapping uh, the Earth's heat. When uh, when you see those those little rainbows around the sun because there is sun, it means that it is colder than than you want. Um, but the the other uh, comment I wanted to make was uh, when we talk about um, electrification. Yes, it's going to be um, massive, but it needs to be, we need to think in terms of beneficial electrification. What does it make sense to do now? What does it make sense for, for us to uh, be working for over the uh, midterm and, and the long term? Uh, so uh, we've got to be smart about um, how we electrify our our systems, not it's not just willy nilly. Yeah, and I, th I think just to add add into that before you jump in, Andrew, it, all, it also speaks to the point of of how it gets paid for, right? And and I think that that is also part of this. We talk about the notion of making sure that the transformation is not borne unequally by by ratepayers or by other folks in in uh, that that have an invested interest. But part of that is also looking at how we currently finance a lot of the uh, the work that's done and who, to a certain extent, um, could play a larger role in a lot of the, the work that needs to happen for electrification. For a long time, financial institutions have not um, played, I think, a, a pivotal enough role in being able to underwrite and provide a significant amount of resources for a lot of electrification we know that needs to happen. Uh, now they're starting to reevaluate and look a little bit differently at the, the risks of a disorderly transition to a decarbonized economy, right? So if we all of a sudden recognize that we have all these goals, we have all these, this momentum is pushing forward and people wait to the end of this decade, for example, to try to start electrifying, then we're gonna see a lot of fluctuation in the market. And for those that are, have a significant financial interest, that becomes a little bit uh, tricky and they start to get a little worried about how that's gonna impact their, uh, their financial interest. So right now we're putting a lot of pressure on the financial institutions to start to do a lot more lending, a lot more underwriting, a lot more financing of the work that can make the, the cost structures for doing the electrification, the beneficial electrification that Carolyn is talking about, as well as some of the, um, the other infrastructure related pieces of this that are not just specific to buildings, but maybe to transportation or to storage and charging infrastructure. All of those things require capital um, now. And I think that we want to make sure that we're putting as much attention as possible on the people that actually can uh, change some of the dynamics that we're used to responding to, which is, can the utility do it? Who pays for it? 
we need to get out of that framework and start to kind of push a little bit more at other levers for people to be involved in this transition. Yeah, I think that's a very, very important point. And there's, there's so many good topics to go, go down. I really want to get um, back uh, soon to what Todd was hinting at, um, but go back to Amy around energy storage um, but as well. And then how is the, what role is the utility playing in, in making that available and financing those projects? Um, because I know that's an area that you, I think you also have been looking into. Um, but Mark, what is what is what role is the city playing in in you talk about putting pressure on on those financial institutions? But are there are there programs being developed? How is it? What kind of frameworks is the city thinking about in terms of um, ensuring that all can participate um, um, and get financing for many of these projects, um, um, not just businesses, but you know, you know small communities and, and so on. Absolutely. So I think we think about it like this. First, you again, you establish the the parameters, the bookends, uh, using legislation to make sure that we are uh, formally setting the agenda uh, for the city and where things need to be moving. We've we've done that pretty aggressively um, with uh, what we call here Local Law 97, which is the establishment of strict carbon caps for um, for large buildings in New York City. So buildings over 25,000 square feet, we've passed legislation that um, puts carbon caps on them based on typology of building. Uh, and if they are above it, when they start reporting in a few years, then they're gonna have to pay a fine. And that fine is gonna be commensurate with them actually doing the work to retrofit it anyway. So they might as well do the work and get all the benefits that come along with it. Uh, simultaneously, we have been rolling out PACE financing in New York City, and those things are going to become active pretty soon, uh, which allows for building owners to take out low interest, long term loans uh, that would pay back within the same time period as the intervention. So if you uh, if you have to replace all your windows and the payback for that effort is, say, seven years, then your loan would be for seven years so that you can uh, be able to take out the uh, get the capital to benefit from the work but be able to pay it back slowly and over time in a way that is more uh, conducive to building owners not necessarily having the capital up front. Uh, and it also, the debt lives with the property, which is great because it doesn't live with the owner and it gets paid back through your property. So those are types of things that help to move the engine. We, um, we've also have a program here called the Accelerator, which is free technical assistance to building owners uh, to be able to meet them wherever they are in terms of being able to begin the work to undertake these retrofits, to make sure they know what they have access to, where they can connect with financing, skill sets, all of those pieces that let them begin to build the package together to take care of their buildings and start to plan out over the next decade how they're gonna um, meet their, their requirements while fitting and kind of dovetailing into their, their normal capital uh, cycle. So those are pieces of a puzzle that kind of move together. Um, that's as it relates to the building sector. In New York City, there's over a million buildings here. So that's the the lion's share of our, our greenhouse gas effort has to focus around that part of the built environment. But it's not just that. It's making sure that we are positioning ourselves to be able to take advantage of uh, you know, the change in the federal administration, making sure that we are um, working aggressively with the state to really capture and explore what this offshore wind market looks like. Um, we, we've been working aggressively to make sure that a lot of the potential for the new wind market can directly connect into New York City. Uh, and that lets us uh, plan and take advantage of not just those electrons, but all of the associated um, downstream impacts from job creation, skill development, and, and other market development comes along with the, um, with the supply chain that goes along with it. So we're positioning ourselves to be the epicenter of a lot of the, 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 kind of the, the green revolution that needs to happen for, um, to change a lot of these energy positioning. But we're also being smart about it. You know, when we passed Local Law 97, we particularly put pieces of, of, uh, of text in there to make sure that Compliance with the law um, has a, from green energy, for example, has to directly connect into New York City. So that means that for all now we have eight and a half million uh, New Yorkers that are kind of working towards the same goal that is getting more renewables directly connected into the load center for um, for the state. So that that's a much um, bigger uh, kind of. Uh, shift in in how we are looking at directing our destiny and making sure that we are now working um, in furtherance of multiple things at the same time. And that's part of what this this lesson and what we're trying to caps encapsulate is we have to do a lot in a short period of time. We need to use every tool we can at our disposal to be able to do that. Can I ask uh, Amy uh, a question? 
yes, you're a chemist, but uh, it's my understanding that there's been a lot of uh, progress in taking a look at um, uh, solar uh, generation um, so that it is um, transparent. And that that has real implications for someplace like New York, as with all of these glass clad buildings, can uh, can they become generation uh, points themselves so that um, uh, we're looking at a, a very different um, uh, electricity and energy use profile uh, in New York City, which which is uh, so so many large buildings with with lots of windows, et cetera. Where is that technology and, and is it ready for prime time? Yeah, I, I think, Carolyn, there's been real advances in that area uh, recently. And I think, you know, it's it's an area where the scientific community is is really focused. So I, I totally agree with you. I think, you know, solar could also provide real opportunity for, for New York and the New York region. Um, I think where storage can help is really in that ability to then provide um, high quality energy, you know, over time. Because what can be challenging even on a sunny day is if you have a, a cloud pass, you know, if you have, a, you know, a downturn in, in the quality of the energy, if you look at solar profiles over time, if you look at wind, and I, I think offshore wind's another opportunity, um, the timescale over which these renewable sources can be intermittent can be a problem. And a lot of times when Everyone is is uh, is at peak work in in New York City is at the same time. You know, we all want you know to access that energy simultaneously. So I think um, coupling storage, coupling wind with storage can really uh, provide benefits. So where we can have um, not only green energy but high quality energy, I think that's what's really going to help adoption and um, really going to help. Um, uh, dissemination of this clean energy to to more more communities. So great, great question. Thanks. If I can just add to that, I, I think storage is going to be a key element to help uh, balance the renewables, as uh, Carolyn and Amy were referring to. Um, it it's still while it has come down in price, um, it still is a rather expensive technology for the amount of energy it can store it so it it will it is playing a role it it will play an important role but we're going to need continue to look for improvements in cost it also requires a relatively large footprint to store a meaningful amount of energy so i think we'll have to Look at other long duration storage uh, systems, which which may may be you know if we get advances in uh, battery technology, it could be battery based, but it could be other sources to help uh, store energy. And as I think um, uh, John was kind of alluding to, you you may even have um, the ability to convert excess renewables in shorter periods of time to effectively make hydrogen. So it could be, um, you know, uh, power to gas, so to speak, or power to renewable gas. But, but I, th I think there's one piece that we need to keep working with, making sure customers understand and can participate with their discretionary loads, whether it's how they choose to charge their electric vehicles as we see more electric vehicle adoption, whether it's, you know, a smart home that is reacting to some of those cloud patterns if there's reduction in renewable energy and you would otherwise be turning on some combustion turbines, can that be communicated in a smart way? So for example, you know, you could uh, change your set points of your air conditioning, refrigeration, or, you know, even schedule some loads to, you know, happen at different times, you know. So as we get smarter and smarter and, and Con Ed is well into its uh, deployment of smart meters, we'll, all of our customers have the tools to understand what their usage is either on a five-minute basis if they're a commercial customer or a 15-minute basis if they're a residential customer. And if we can tie that into uh, whether it's a battery at the customer location or you know some programmable loads uh, that that's really where we're going to 
have the advantage and be able to make meaningful headway while we wait for the new technologies to evolve in, you know, whether it's 10 or 15 years down the road to get to that 100% carbon-free goal. Uh, we, we, we need to use the technologies we have now to make meaningful strides while we develop and hopefully reduce the cost of uh, the next round of technologies that'll take us the, uh, further along the pathway. So Steve, you mentioned, you know, customer devices. Um, and when I hear that, I think I hear smart devices. Um, and it goes back to what Carolyn was mentioning about digitization, but also the access to that digital infrastructure. Um, Carolyn, can you talk about any potential challenges and, and, and solutions for, you know, customers, you know, having access to these types of solutions? Um, and what have you seen as being some of the, the biggest challenges to potentially adoption is solely around cost or um, access to, to digital infrastructure um, and any solutions you are aware of to kind of overcome some of those kind of equity challenges, you, you know, having sure that these technologies are available to to, to, some, to our customers? Well, certainly um, having access to uh, uh, to broadband is is critical. Um, you know, there are a lot of, of um, even urban communities that still don't have um, reliable broadband access. Um, and, and we've seen that with, with uh, our children trying to um, be educated remotely. If you, if you don't have the uh, broadband access to the building, then um, I guess for me, the question is, how, do you, how then can we um, take advantage of of people's cell phones or or whatever, and to to provide that kind of uh, digital access, while at the same time protecting privacy, um, because frankly, I I don't think I'd want my my cell phone to uh, to be the avenue into um, the utility or the city or or whomever, uh, and they can figure out whatever I'm I'm doing. Um, I think that's that's really one of the big places we we need to think about is how do how do we get there um, in a way that protects privacy but also um, uh, make sure that we are serving the needs of the least of us. Sounds like a, a clear another lesson from from COVID nineteen um, kind of you know highlights kind of what we need to. To do, you know, think about uh, doing to be responsive to what the challenges presented by climate change. Um, in, any any thoughts there, Mark, in terms of you know the the digital infrastructure and access to that, um, as well as is um, more the same with regards to kind of you know ensuring that you know financing is available to build that infrastructure out. So I think that uh, again, kind of hit the nail on the head with that. Is like you can have as many. Uh, technological kind of advances and innovations as as we can think of, if they are not meeting the people where they are, then they will not be effective, right? And being able to make sure that we are uh, changing the, the 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 question that we're trying to a to answer, it's like people being able to have access to to Wi-Fi and broadband uh, is a a threshold of inclusion. And it's something that that whether we are talking about my two kids trying to get online uh, for for class every morning, which is a hot mess, by the way, or um, we're talking about uh, being able to be able to quickly look at what your real time energy usage is and make decisions on how you live your life for the remainder of the month accordingly. Like that's all uh, now becoming a threshold of inclusion. Uh, and the data allows for it, but unless we're able to connect it to people, how they're living their lives, it is not going to yield the results that it, it potentially could. And the question I think we're trying to get at is who's responsible for that and who has to be able to uh, change what they're doing, the services they're delivering, the means by which they're delivering them in order to achieve that. And my argument or contention is that, of course, as a policymaker, I am always trying to bridge those gaps and and develop um, ways to connect them. But I'm also trying to up the the ante for everyone involved and say that like people are not able to can only consider one thing. So if you are delivering the service, you need to now say that part of the 
in the service meaning electrons, you need to now start to think about the fact that data needs to go along with that. And you have a role and a responsibility to play in how you can contribute towards providing more access as a result of it. So no one gets off the hook is what I'm saying. Like everyone has to play a larger role in this or we don't make it. We don't, we're not able to, to transition effectively. Uh, and so what I try to do is put as many sticks in place as possible to start to push people in that direction. Uh, but it's, but ultimately I think that being able to have more accountability for all the different players in, in, in these, um, in these kind of narratives is where we start to get more innovation and more activity because we'll find that uh, if you are able to have someone come to to someone's residence to check their meter every day or i mean every uh you know every month or however you do it often then that that moment of interaction that moment where the person opening their door to to let you in or to you know use your 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 Wi-Fi reader closely to the to the meter, that's a point in which maybe multiple things can happen. And maybe there's a way in which we use those interactions with people's lives to make it better for them and and be able to uh, stack on the levels of intervention that give us more and give us a better on-ramp to being able to participate in the energy future that we're all working towards. So and people need to be more creative and we need to be pushing them to do that. Right. I'd like to maybe go back. I uh, want to get Don in here and talk about a little bit more about what you know, natural grid or the gas um, utilities are focused on in terms of engaging customers on, on the, 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 the in the area of gas. And what is what is the gas industry doing uh, to help kind of you know meet customers where they are, give them the service that they provide, but also um, kind of help achieve these achieve these additional goals um, around you know net zero. Um, you can, ex can expand on what you were kind of referring to earlier. Sure. So the gas industry is in the middle of a transformation. You know, it's making a big pivot. Um, before getting into that, some of the sort of business as usual, not some bulbs, it's all about energy efficiency. That's a low hanging fruit. What are you doing to reduce demand? Uh, your traditional energy, in the, you know, energy efficiency programs, same as electric, you know, more boilers, I mean, boilers are much more efficient. There's a second piece of this, which is reducing methane emissions. And it's not just methane emissions at the distribution side, but it's also from wellhead to burner tip. You know, this is engaging the entire value chain. Um, you know, years ago, quite frankly, National Group would say, you know, we are responsible for our methane emissions that we manage, right? We manage our, let's say, distribution system in Brooklyn, Staten Island, New York. We no longer say that, right? We now say we are responsible for the methane emissions, even for the Part of the system that we don't own and operate. So we, you know, how do we engage the entire value chain from production to your uh, to your help to your home? Um, the biggest change for the gas industry, this pivot that I'm making towards the transformation, is what I was referring to earlier. It's decarbonizing the molecules. So we, uh, National Grid, we file, you know, in our rate cases, what we call future heat. Now we file our first one in downstate New York. Uh, for Long Island, New York City in April, I think it was 2019. We just filed one in our upstate in July for upstate New York, and we just filed our Boston gas just a couple of weeks ago. And in all of these future of heat rate cases, we're talking about this energy efficiency. We talk about electrification because that's part of the answer. But then we focus, how do we scale these low carbon fuels into our system and integrate them? So what we are doing now to scale, what's here and now is the biomass feedstock. So if you think livestock, manure, wastewater, food waste, which they use technology known as anaerobic digestion, that technology is proven. It's been around for, uh, you know, for a long time. We're trying to scale those technologies now. And we, this is not just grid. I think there is you know, a lot of major utilities are trying to scale and integrate that as part of their supply. And at the same time, we are laying the foundation for hydrogen. We all know and we all think that hydrogen will play a very big role. It will play a big role across multiple sectors. It doesn't neatly fit in the gas. It fits in, it's sort of, it's just, an, it's this intersection between gas and electricity, but it also touches the other sectors that I mentioned earlier. So we're laying that foundation. And by the way, it touches a lot to, I think what Amy was talking about, the storage. You know, we, we see turning the gas network as essentially a very large battery to help 
the lithiums and the batteries that more people are familiar with, because those technologies are on the scales of tens of megawatts, maybe even hundreds of megawatts, and they're basically moving energy hourly or daily, right? You're peak shaving, you're moving load from day to night. But what happens if you need that to go into thousands of megawatts or terawatts? And what happens if you do need it for days, right? That's when we start thinking also about how do we use the gas network as a battery? Because there have been simulations that have been run, both on East Coast, West Coast, consultants have done them, NREL has done them. And you will see there are like six consecutive days where there is no wind in winter, right? And it could be on the East Coast. So then you start to realize the Steve's question, I think Steve was alluding to this, right? The scalability of the storage to integrate these low carbon fuels can be actually very significant and the duration. So all of these elements and integrating these into the gas network to get to the net zero is the pivot that we are making. But I'll come back to just summarize the biggest transformation that's taking place in the gas industry today across the country, Europe, and even places like Japan and Australia is thinking about decarbonizing the molecules because there is a pivot, right? We are gonna move away from geological gas and methane over time into these molecules that will have much lower carbon footprints. So, so Amy, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead, Stevie. Yeah, I, I, I was just gonna say, I, I, I think, just like the electric utilities have gone through a transformation to sort of embrace a distributed source of renewable supply, I, I think our gas utilities, and Con Edison does have a gas utility um, uh, juxtaposed to National Grid down in the, you know, uh, uh, Westchester and, you know, um, uh, uh, Bronx, Queens uh, area, um, making it easier for Customers who have potential renewable gas, whether it's coming off of you know uh, sewage treatment plants, whether it's uh, other biogas production, making it easier for them to interconnect and inject into our system is going to be really key to help decarbonizing the gas system. But I I think we also have to work with customers and contractors to increase the awareness of and receptivity to uh, heat pump technologies as well, because, you know, we currently have a moratorium up in Westchester where due to supply constraints, we are not uh, able to connect new gas customers. So we have to give our customers alternatives and make sure that they understand and work with uh, the building trades as well to make sure that they embrace the alternative technologies. And so we, you know, back to kind of the premise of we've got to use the tools that are available now until the new tools become commercialized and can be rolled out. So uh, we, we don't want to just sit around and do nothing because there are meaningful advances we can make with the tools we've got now while we wait for whether it's longer duration storage, whether it's, uh, you know, power to uh, gas technologies, you know, to produce hydrogen or, or you know, cleaner methane, you know, the, uh, the, those will have to be part of the future, but we don't have them in our toolbox now. So we have to use the tools that we do have and you know certainly energy storage uh, on on a large scale is one of those tools and you know is going to be important to help balance the day to day not necessarily the seasonal swings and amy i, I love yeah, to I think... jump in and add um, to that where you know those future tools what is how is energy storage advancing um uh, both for the electric side or for 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 the gas side i would love to kind of give the audience a, a perspective on on how that the, the technology is advancing and, and what's to come in the future absolutely so i think that there there are uh te energy storage technologies available um that that can be relevant but part of the challenge is that um their initial development was for other applications. So if we if we think about you know lithium ion as an example, it's been a very effective technology um, for portable consumable electronics. It's been further advanced towards vehicle technology, and there's been real investment in that in that area over time. Uh, part of the challenge with going to large format, large scale lithium ion batteries is managing heat, managing the heat they produce, you know, managing that heat safely. And that's a, so the, the, the cost that goes into the, those systems comes from two places, the 
some of the precious materials that are used to make the battery and also, you know, safely managing and mitigating the heat that they generate. So I think if I envision a future uh, battery for the grid um, that, that's ideal for deployment, then it would be based on more sustainable materials. Um, I think the size of the system would be less important than its, its lifetime and, and how long it can last. And so I think I'm, you know, as, as Stephen mentioned, in the meantime, you know, the goal is to effectively deploy available technology while continuing to build um, the fundamental data set, the fundamental research to enable a new technology and new technology advances so that we can still use um, effectively the available tools. Um, they may be able to be deployed without the same type of infrastructure investment that other types of energy solutions may require. So that can also be a desirable, you know, stopgap if we're if we're trying to build up infrastructure. Um, but I think we need an understanding in each case of what the technology will deliver and what what its limitations are. If we have that, and if we have that through uh, scientific framework, then um, that's what we need to, to to push the bar. So, and I think the link between you know vehicles and, and grid is, is a real opportunity as well. So you know as we have additional Adoption of um, um, batteries, you know, in cars. If if we can think about, you know, vehicle to grid, I think there's real opportunity there as well. And I think the the science is advancing towards that. You know, we have a project focused on fast charge of batteries for the grid. I think there's um there's opportunity there there as well, particularly in the New York area. Speaking to vehicle to grid, uh, Steve, uh, you, maybe you can add uh, and give the audience a perspective on on what an application like that looks like um, and, and what's going on today. Sure, um, uh, we were able to work with the uh, White Plains School District and taking some of the money that was available from the uh, settlement with Volkswagen and basically um, provide them with electric school buses, uh, which have the wonderful benefit. You know, if, if you remember as a kid, those big yellow buses would pull up. And if you were a little, little kid, the exhaust pipe was right about, you know, mouth level. So, you know, if, if, if you were near the back of the bus on the outside, that was not a healthy place to be breathing in air. So this bus now comes up. It is clean, emission-free to take uh, kids to school. And during the summertime, when there's no school in session, we use that basically as a uh, grid battery to charge when prices are low on, overnight and on the weekends and discharge when prices are higher and there's higher emissions from the generating unit on the margin. So it is both an economic and an environmental benefit. And so I'm, I'm not sure every customer is going to want to have you know, someone else, you know, push and pull electrons out of their vehicle. But the simplest way of it is just making sure they're aware of the price signals and the corresponding carbon usage so that they can, even if they're they're not discharging, so they can smartly charge so that their vehicle can wait until there's more renewable power available, you know, and if you couple that with economics, you have the natural economic signal, let me help you reduce your cost of operating this vehicle while that ties in with improving the environment. So so that's the win-win, even if we don't get every electric vehicle to do two-way pushes and pulls, as long as they're being smart on the consumption side, that's probably half or two-thirds of the benefit of the full vehicle to grid that we're doing with the White Plains School District. Great. One thing I, I haven't heard um, kind of fully explored is the business models that can be wrapped around a lot of this. It's, it's going to be, with all this change, it's going to come a, lot, a tremendous opportunity from a business standpoint, from innovation, of innovating new solutions. But how do they get scaled into the market and, and how do businesses um, uh, make money potentially uh, on opportunities? Um, so I'm curious for anyone to kind of speak to kind of is there a gap in, in business models today that can enable these solutions to scale? Um, and if there's a gap, kind of how, how are we potentially solving, solving for that today? 
And I, I suspect Mark is going to have a, a number of, of um, suggestions on that. But if you look at the history of um, infrastructure in our country, whether it is uh, bridges and dams and roads, or it's the electricity system, the scale that we're talking about is much larger than uh, just the private sector uh, or individual businesses um, are probably willing or able to handle on their own. So there's going to have to be um, both public and private sector participation. That that's why energy utilities were formed um, was to to allow for the uh, kinds of infrastructure investments to be made, and then to make sure that they get um, get a return to pay for that that investment. But um, a lot of the part of the dilemma, at least for me, is that um, on these the scalability issues, we're talking about uh, something that that may look like a utility model, but with decentralization, that utility model doesn't necessarily work anymore. So I think there does have to be um, a change in the way we look at. Uh, fundamental funding of some of these these projects. Having said that, um, for smaller businesses in particular and for businesses in our community, um, just one example of, of a potential pivot is that we look at refrigeration. You know, we, we think about um, um, refrigerators, and we think about HVAC units and all these other things, and we focus on the technology at the beginning, you know, what's in them, um, uh, how do we install them, etc. But nobody's really looking at the ongoing um, maintenance of those. And so we wind up losing a lot of the benefit over time of um, refrigeration technology through lack of maintenance because they start leaking, et cetera. Nobody, uh, nobody really is looking at how, do, how do we develop an industry around maintaining that equipment? That's probably something that small business can take care of, especially plumbers or, um, electricians, et cetera. And, uh, and and they're going to be locally based, so um, it it certainly is an area where a little bit of of um, creative thought might actually uh, develop a uh, an industry that we don't necessarily have now, but is going to be very important as we move forward. Yeah, I think that there's going to be a lot of growth that we are anticipating uh, in the small business sector, of course. So like we're, we're, you know, and there's nothing that anyone hasn't, you know, imagined or envisioned. It's like, you know, are we going to see a huge immersion of more people that need to be able to know how to move electrons around? Yes. So like, there's going to have to be much more growth in, in the normal trades and skills as we are doing the physical work of transitioning all the different, uh, pieces of of our lives, transportation, mobility, uh, buildings, uh, where we go to work, where we go to school, all of those places and the interstitial spaces between them. Absolutely. Um, but I think that what's important to recognize is that there's two sides of this. There's the part of it that is going to be all the gap filling um, that's going to be with electrified bikes and people moving things around and, and doing that differently. And then there's the massive investment that could only come from a active centralized federal government that is going to set the this stage for all of this. So uh, I know that, you know, we're going to have to be able to kind of plug and play in, in our day-to-day -day lives, whether it is um, you know, taking electricity from my vehicle, putting it into my house or vice versa, or having all the different pieces um, where I can, uh, you know, be a much larger instrument in in my, uh, my kind of uh, pow power access or access to electricity. But we need We've been spending the last four years in particular uh, in a resistance and and not being able to push as much as possible on the massive infrastructure um, investment that's necessary for uh, at the the scale that's necessary to to unlock these things. 
we can't do that without uh, an active federal government. And so right now we're positioning and kind of being prepared for what we hope to be much more kind of massive investment that will come from the from the federalized federal government. And then that will unlock the ability for cities and states to actually be able to implement a lot of the plans that we put in place that will then have all of the implications for small businesses. Because right now, even on the back end of COVID, where we've lost so much, there's so much work to be done. And we're going to need a huge jump start in order to be able to do that so that the money can start flowing and that people can actually start um, developing all of these business models that we know are um, pretty much um, tested, and we know they're going to be able to be implemented. They just need the the capital to get moving. Great. Any any additional uh, thought I see or on my uh, you like to add? Yeah, I, I was nodding my head. I'll, I'll add, you know, I'll associate myself with all the comments that Mark and Callan just made. You know, environment agreement. The only thing I will add is, you know, having been around thinking about climate change now for, it feels like a long time, but more than 10 years, I feel like we're caught in this loop that we can't get out of, that I think one thing that will really make a significant impact, to answer your question, that will really impact the business model, is having a price on carbon, right? At some point, there has to be, because right now, a lot of, you know, when, you know, you're driving your cars, right, you press the pedal, the CO2 that comes out of your stack, you don't really pay for it, right? But there is a societal cost, right? If you think about climate change, so at some point, and states can do this, you know, states are doing this on their own. Um, you know, California does its thing, the Northeast, the states in the Northeast, like particularly in New York and Massachusetts. But I see a need for a price for carbon, probably the federal level, whether it's a carbon tax or cap and trade. And I think once that happens, Andrew, then it unleashes a whole new sort of innovations because then there is a price or that carbon. I think that's the only comment that I just wanted to, you know, add to what Mark and Callum were saying. Yeah, we, we've taken baby steps in the Northeast uh, with the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which uh, tries to value carbon on electric generation, but it, it's only on the electric side. And it has helped uh, reduce emissions in, you know, throughout the Northeast. But to Don's point, we, we really need an economy-wide valuation, and then you know, uh, entrepreneurs and and you know, uh, will develop products and technologies that will be economically efficient based on that price signal. And customers and and builders and developers can make informed choices of, of what appliances to put in, understanding the carbon impact of those appliances. Because right now, a lot of construction is really targeting lowest first cost instead of, you know, lifetime operating costs, let alone lifetime operating plus societal costs related to emissions. So that's where we need to drive to. Uh, if we get the price signals right, you'll have the innovation happening. You may still need some, whether it's utility, state, or federal incentives to um, sort of push some of the fringe technologies into the mainstream, you know, to really enable them and to make sure that uh, we do wind up with all of the tools in our toolbox. I like that analogy to get to um, the goals that uh, both New York as well as other states in the region have laid out. Well, that's excellent. I think just to expand on some of the points that were being made with regards to, you know, new technologies being deployed into the market, potential maintenance or lack uh, the skills needed to perform that maintenance. Um, and, and, and think about maintenance in the electric school bus example you provided, Steve. Uh, I'm not sure the local mechanic would, would understand how to, you know, fix and maintain that um, a bi-directional capable um, school bus. So it begs the question, like, you know, what do we, what do we do around workforce development? Um, you know, in terms of the future skills that would be required to, to, to deploy, integrate, um, and maintain a lot of these new new systems, um, and also kind of work equity in the workforce. You know, what are what are some of the challenges um, there, and how could they be proactively addressed? If kids with a pedal uh, take it on that. So, so I know NYSERDA is doing a lot of that in terms of offshore wind, trying to make sure that we develop the jobs. Mm -hmm the skills to support the emerging offshore wind industry. And I know the city as well, the Economic Development Corp is looking at a lot of properties that could be utilized to try to help with 
the construction and the maintenance uh, of that. Because as we get towards, you know, New York's goal of 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind, coupled with our neighboring states, it is going to be a booming industry. We've already seen, you know, great job creations within the solar uh, industry as well. And so, you know, the the green economy is actually producing more jobs than some of the um, uh, waning high carbon uh, electric sectors that uh, um, the current federal administration was trying to uh, uh, maintain. So there's sort of an interesting irony that uh, the the natural enthusiasm for doing the right thing and and the right price signals will spur job creation. But I do think it, it's a it's an important point that within our you know, uh, the, the high schools with, with a strong STEM curriculum have to be exposing, you know, um, uh, their students, and, and a lot of them are doing a great job of it, to some of these emerging technologies so they can anticipate and build on the skills that will really last them a lifetime and help us environmentally. And I, I would argue that it, it's, it, yes, absolutely, it's what um, Steve was saying about um uh, creating the framework for uh, for more people to have on ramps into a lot of these emerging um, uh, opportunities, but we also need to be cognizant about the fact that again we need a bigger team, right? And so we need more uh, activism that goes along with this. So it means that in addition to preparing technologically for people to be able to take part in these these growing sectors. We need to kind of make sure that we are ringing the alarm bell that everyone has a role to play in this. And no matter kind of where you're coming into this work, you have an opportunity to uh, to be an activist and to be um, uh, calling for um, there to be more opportunities for, for inclusion for you to be a part of it. And I think that we often kind of look at the same uh, market models for how we do things, whether it is around the carbon pricing or the or the market kind of approaches to different parts, which are important and necessary. But we also have to we have to push harder and make sure that we are um, we are providing uh, more of a catalyst for people to change, because we've been a lot of us on this kind of panel have been ringing this bell and kind of doing this work for decades. And it's not it's not doing enough quickly enough. It's and, and and so I think that if we if we think that there's going to just be a technological solution that is going to all of a sudden galvanize everyone you know, into common cause, I, I disagree. Right. And so I think that we have to we have to make sure that we are constantly um, providing uh, their providing more room so we can build a bigger team and that more people can be pushing in different sectors that they're a part of. And that doesn't just mean the usual ones that are that are similar to us in like in the building trades or in the energy space. It means those in the arts, it means those in education, it means those in finance, it means all of the different parts uh, that kind of comprise our economy need to take their role actively in transforming it. This is not a zero sum game. What for the for the audience listening today? What actionable next steps would you recommend that they take? Um, once we we sign off today, we go back to our, our day to day. Mark, you mentioned that people need to push harder and and they have a role to play. What can what, what would we want to communicate um, to the to the, to everyone kind of watching this this, this session now? And, and and what actionable next steps would, could could they take um, um, going forward? I'm sure people have a lot of suggestions. I'll just say, generally speaking, you have to show up, right? And and we're trying to find more opportunities and tools and ways for you to do so. I mean, one of the things you'll notice around New York City right now is that we've been rolling out since October, um, building energy grades that are now going to be posted on in front of buildings, nutrition labels for the building performance. It's you know, there's a lot of argument as to whether or not that's the best way to interpret your building. Doesn't matter. It gives you more information. It gives more access to people entering into a building, uh, the tools to be able to ask questions. So take advantage of it, ask questions, and those questions lead to other actions that you are holding other people accountable for. So I think showing up is is being part, recognizing that you have a, a role to play. It's asking questions to those people in power. It's asking questions to people at your school. How's your the school's performance doing? How are they incorporating some of this work into the, the curriculum? 
and, and that that starts to kind of get us in a place where everyone is co- being more uh, involved in in potential opportunities for for growth. And what we'll continue to do is to try to put more data out there and to hold more people accountable to, to make their data transparent, so that people can mine that data and come up with better ways and better opportunities. But the last thing I'll, I'll also say is the notion of showing up. I get that it's hard to. Um, come to a city council hearing or to uh, come to, uh, you know, some technical advisory panel or something that you're a part of, we all have a lot of constraints, but those are really where decisions happen that impact a lot of the development of policy and people need to hear from you. And I, and I, and I, I, my argument is that in this kind of COVID world where things are all upside down, the ability for you to log in is oftentimes easier than the ability for you to show up at City Hall or, or somewhere else. So make, take advantage of that and be present and let your voice be heard. That's how we start to kind of build that momentum is more people recognizing that this is for you too and that your voice matters. And that helps us to be able to push uh, these initiatives more quickly and push them harder. I I absolutely agree with, with Mark and just a, a couple of, of examples. Um, I was able to um, meet with um, the current administrator of EPA um, about a year or so ago. And as part of that meeting, um, uh, some of us identified the problem that churches in communities of color are often um, uh, the last to be able to um, improve their physical plants, et cetera. And when they started, uh, if they if they needed to do that, they had had problems with um, whether it was HUD because they were operating a, um, a group home or it was HHS because they were doing um, feeding feeding people or it was EPA because they found mold or, or lead or asbestos. And we asked EPA, how can you, EPA, use your... Um, uh, ability to pull federal agencies together to help uh, churches in our community. As a, as a result of that, EPA came out with, with a, um, uh, a, a document for churches to say, this is what you can do to, to make your, your church and your plant um, more energy efficient. So there is some of that that information out there. The other the other example, though, is um, uh, going back to Mark's comment. I worked for the South Coast Air Quality Management District uh, earlier in my um, career, and we published a list of the top ten polluters. Just publishing that list made a significant difference in the way people were operating their facilities because they didn't want to be on that that list. Um, so publishing what the uh, performance is of buildings or uh, or other kinds of systems is going to make a, a difference in the way um, those organizations operate their facilities because they don't want to be on that dirty dozen or or bottom 10 list. And so if we if we do that in all of our um, uh, activities, we start asking those kinds of questions at work. Um, and, and we do it at home, we do it in our churches, etc. That that gains momentum. And, um, and that's how each one reaches one. How does how does the what's the utilities role in reaching out to to, to customers and 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 helping them um, you know get motivated to to, to take action? Um, or we present them with new new opportunities, um, new rates, new um, and you know how, how what is the utilities role in in, in kind of engaging customers and in moving them towards taking action on on some of these opportunities? So, so I think it comes back to the um, comes back to the digitization that uh, Carolyn was referring to because our our customers are much 
different today than they were, you know, 30 years ago when I first joined the utility space where, you know, we, we refer to them as accounts. We would send a bill out to them. The best uh, relationship for, for, you know, back then was, you know, they paid their bill and didn't call us. We've come a long way since then. It's making, it's figuring out how to communicate with them on social media. It's how to have a good digital experience. So as they transact, we, we become a valued information provider to help them with their choices, not just when to use energy, but uh, what products that, you know, they might want to uh, choose as, you know, wh wh whether they're thinking of installing rooftop solar or upgrading their HVAC or putting in, you know, smart thermostats so that they can be comfortable when they walk into their home. Uh, it's it's providing them with the tools and capabilities to make informed decisions in ways that, you know, technologically didn't exist 10 years ago and we didn't have the means of communicating in the same way. So, so we're finding much more digital interactions with our customers, uh, which, which I think is going to continue to evolve and become more sophisticated. And just to build on what Steve said is our transformation, you know, very consistent, right? We have moved towards a customer centric focused company. Right? We try to view everything from the customer's lens rather than the old model. So, you know, utility operates in the basement. I send you a check, kind of leave me alone um, perspective. And we want them to be heard, right? We're trying to do also our best to get to the point that Mark was making about engagement because policy has historically been made by people that are the most vocal, right? And they advocate, which is their job. But I think when we think about climate change and this transition, and it is a transformation of everything we do, we want them to be heard and getting them engaged is a challenge for us. And the only thing I, you know, I would add is, you know, from the customer and the community perspective, we also do a lot of reaching out because we see a huge need for, you know, engineers, right? And we want them, you know, we, we, we need them, right? We want them to come from our local communities. There is a gap. And there are sort of STEM programs. And as we think about integrating all of the technologies we talked about, utilities, if you want to think of them, really it's an institution, right, that has a lot of engineers. And we see that workforce evolving and changing as well, which is really a great opportunity when you think about you know, the young people and the careers that they're choosing to start thinking about. Great. I think that's a good place to pivot to some uh, questions. We have a couple of questions that are that are coming in. Um, and one question came in stating, you know, you know, we have a, a chapter middle school initiative um, that came in. It says launch. Uh, I work at a launch charter middle school, and we're in a phase one of our field Floyd Bennett field project, and we are the first school in our city to design to advance racial equity and sustainability. Um, students will learn about solar energy and wind energy, and there will be a farm and other great things. Would Abe and the other distinguished panels be willing to meet with the board to discuss ways to incorporate into the curriculum emerging technologies and other topics um, you have touched? Uh, just speaking from an Abe perspective, you know, the Abe NIMAC has a summer energy academy uh, for middle and high school um, called the C. You can go to www.cprogram.org, um, but it's a great entryway into kind of meeting with that team and helping to, to design a specific program for that school. Um, and we could also kind of point you to one of our, our aid members, is Jerry Dodd, um, and you can have the team reach out to you, but open it up for the um, panelists to kind of speak to that as well. I answer a quick one. Yes. Yep. Happy, to, happy to meet, happy to coordinate. Great. great. Same here, absolutely. That's a no brainer. <laughs> <laughs> We start off with the software. <laughs> and, and, it, and it ties back. It, it's a feedback loop. We, we need to be engaged uh, with our community and with young aspiring you know, students to help them along their journey to you know, develop the future. You know, uh, engineers, policymakers, you know, uh, uh, scientists to, to help us get to our goals. And and just to go into the next question, you know, how do members of the energy sector build meaningful and sustainable partnerships with vulnerable communities? Show up. Show up and 
one show Absolutely. up to listen um, rather than uh, just talk to people, listen to what they're saying, and 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 then act on on that. And create the space to do that. I think you don't, you're not sure what you're going to get. Create the space to have those conversations, and that's the beginning. And it's not a once and done. It, it it's an ongoing commitment to the communities that we're engaged with, that we have facilities in, that we work with. So it 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 can't be by exception because that that's not effective. Great. And I think we have uh, time for w one more. What are the ways that vulnerable communities can hold energy, the energy sector um, and related sectors accountable? I mean, I think they're doing a lot of that right now. And I think they're, they're, the activism is increasing rapidly. I think the question is, um, what is everyone doing to respond to that and to make sure that we are actively um, letting uh, the voices be heard from from communities that have been again ringing alarm bells for quite some time. So I think that I, I would say that vulnerable communities are shouting from the rooftops. The question is, are we doing the, the a good enough job of creating the spaces to listen and to incorporate that into into action? And to amplify those those voices uh, to the extent that we in the energy industry and we in aid in particular, that's why aid was formed was to amplify the voices uh, that are in our community and to give them the, uh, the tools they need to, uh, to be able to communicate those concerns even more. Great. Um, there was one question around offshore wind, but I think we had a good discussion on it. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much um, for one, the opportunity to kind of listen to this very dynamic conversation. Um, I think that the audience got a, a substantial value from, from it. And, and, and I think that, you know, the better to keep the conversation going, um, motivate people to show up. Um, and, 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 and like you said, listen, uh, I think that's one of the most important pieces of communication, listening, um, and, and meeting people where they are. So, so thank you, um, Carolyn, Mark, Steve, Amy, Don, really appreciate it. Um, and and just to, on a final note, um, for everyone that's listening, the Energy and Commerce Committee will be will be speaking um, there. So thank you. Take care.